Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. Fonterra's annual results will be announced today. In fact, just after we record this show. Joining me now is KPMG's agribusiness partner, Ian Proudfoot. And Ian, great to see you. Thanks. And what do you think the results are going to show? I think they're going to be really interesting. I think, from my perspective, I'm very interested about what Fonterra are going to say about what the situation looks going forward. The other kind of exciting thing is that Fonterra have got to tell a slightly different story than they've told before when they've released their results. They've actually got to explain to those people that are going to think about investing in the TAF scheme what drives profit in Fonterra and what has actually contributed to the dividend. So that's going to mean there will be a different focus from Fonterra's announcement this year, much more aligned to a normal corporate type announcement. Now that's interesting. Uh, TAF, of course, uh, they're hoping, Fonterra, that it gets off the ground in November. But before we go to that, can we just talk about uh, global dairy prices at the moment? Uh, uh, they've, they've gone up, what, 20%, 21% over the last couple of months. But overall, it's still pretty bad, isn't it, around the world? Oh, I think you've got to say we're, we're probably now seeing the impact of what is obviously quite a constrained supply position coming out of the United States. There was an expectation that the dairy industry would really be starting to pump there now. The, the drought and the increase in the cost of corn has, has meant many cows have now been sent to slaughter as a way of clearing stock and reducing costs. So I suppose as I look at it, I think the situation is far better than it was uh, two or three months ago. And I, you know, I, I would imagine that this trend, which now seems to be starting to appear of, of, of a series of increases in GDT, should be becoming established. I think we'll still see some volatility, but I think we're now heading in the right direction. Yeah, we've had four increases, correct, yep. in a row, which is terrific. Do you think it's going to affect the payout for dairy farmers in New Zealand? Well, they're obviously 525, I think Westland's now got a slightly higher number than that. So I think there's, there's a general view that we may well have, have reached the bottom of that cycle and reached it pretty quickly, far quicker than maybe we expected to. So I, I suppose where I sit at the moment, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to see a, a better payment forecast. I don't think we'll see Fonterra change today, though. I still think it's probably too early. And I think probably where they're sitting at the moment is, is probably where they'd be comfortable. Of course, uh, Sir Henry Vander Hayden is getting ready to exit the picture. John Wilson preparing to step into, uh, into the role. Uh, what are you expecting? What kinds of changes do you expect? Well, John Wilson's been on the board for a very long time. He's, he's been there pretty well for the, the last 10 years. So I, I don't think we're going to see a rapid change in direction. And I think Obviously, in looking for a, a new chairman, they're, they're looking for somebody that's consistent with the, the new direction that FIO's given to the cooperative. So my, my expectation is that um, we'll, we'll see very much, to begin with anyway, a sort of steady-as-you-go course. I think the interesting thing when you look at the board elections coming up is obviously there's free vacancies on the board that people, or free positions on the board up for election. When you look at the board at the moment, there's not a director coming out of the South Island. And with the amount of milk coming, and obviously Darfield this week just starting to ship its first Correct, product, yeah, yeah. You know, obviously South Island is more and more important as a supply base to Fonterra, so it'll be interesting to see if we get a director coming from, from that constituency. Well, let's hope so. Mm. Uh, now, listen, let's talk about TAF. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, Fonterra has been holding a lot of focus groups with farmers. A lot of confusion out there still. Very simply, how's it going to work? It is quite complex and you know I've, I've spent quite a lot of time working through the whole thing to understand it. I suppose how fundamentally it's going to work is there is an opportunity for farmers to sell the equity interest in their shares into, um, into the, the, the new shareholders fund that will be established. That fund by the government has required it to raise $500 million. If not enough farmers sell the interest in their shares, that raises an interesting question though. Do Fonterra need to issue new shares to the fund? So we might hear something about that today. I know they're obviously doing focus groups to work out what the sort of supply of shares is going to be. But I think for a, a, a normal farmer, um, a farmer that's got a business that um, has a, a reasonably conservative level of gearing, I, I think they'd probably be looking to try and retain as many of their shares as possible and, and maybe every now and then trade some shares through, through the market to. Um, to provide a bit of liquidity. And Ian, what are you picking? How much interest is there in people who aren't farmers to get involved now in the fund? Oh, I think there's a lot of interest in the fund. I think, um, I think there's, there's a real desire amongst New Zealand investors to have some exposure to what is our key economic sector in, in respect of dairy. And really there's been very limited opportunity to access that up until now. And what kind of investors are you picking will, uh, will, will be uh, lining up at the cab ring? I, I think you'll probably find there'll be a reasonable number of Fonterra farmers. Um, pretty close to the front of the queue, looking to increase their investment in the, the value-add part of the, the cooperative. I think you'll probably find the institutions 
um, trying to cut each other's throats to get into the, the process, I think they'll be very keen. But I also think somebody with a balanced portfolio of New Zealand investments will want to have Fonterra in that portfolio. All right, from Fonterra to Rabobank. And that they're now predicting that around the world, food prices are going to be higher than they've ever been before. They're talking about eggflation in 2013. Uh, are they being too doomsday? Um, to get another peak like 2008, you know, that's going to be pretty dramatic level of inflation. Um, but there's no doubt food assets are becoming strategically more important and the cost of food is on a long-term trend upwards and as we have to feed more people and the, de the supply isn't growing as fast as the demand's growing that we will see continuous increases in food pricing so I agree with Rabobank in that res respect and I suppose from my Asia Pacific role the messaging we're getting back from talking to a lot of my businesses business partners out around the region is that the consolidation is becoming rife the companies in the sector are looking at how they can better cope to deliver supply because for a lot of the governments in the Asia Pacific region the inability to feed their population presents a real risk to their continued position as government so it is really a social political economic issue. So what can we do farmers here to cash in on on what could be a a dire situation for people around the world. I don't think there's much we can do because fundamentally we can only feed a defined number of people and you know you hear anything between 20 and 100 million I'm, I don't know precisely where that number is everybody has their own view but we, we're, we're never going to be a bulk supplier of food to the the wide masses what we need to do is be very very defined around who we're going to try and target and making sure that we we have solutions and products that can win in the niches we want to compete in so it's, it's being very particular, very choosy and very focused. And, I, you know, we've talked about Fonterra already. I think that's really what their strategy is about being, you know, can we win in China? And if so, what sector of the Chinese market can we win in? And they're really targeting that down into that health and nutritional milk products. So to my mind, we need to do more and more of that. Where can we win and focus on it really intently? Thanks, Ian. Stay with Money Talks. More after the break. Welcome back to Money Talks. We're here with Ian Proudfoot and joining us now is business commentator Rod Oram and Massey University economist Christoph Schumacher. And Christoph, you're just back from Germany. What's going on over there? Well, it's a very interesting place at the moment with everything that's happening in Europe and the German people are no longer happy to pay the bills. So I've never seen them so vocal. Being out on the streets with banners uh, in the beer gardens, they talk about politics. So it's actually nice to see that people talk politics. Um, but unfortunately, it feels like the euro is bringing more of a divide to Europe uh, than the idea of uniting. Europe. Okay, we'll talk about that, but first of all, I see you brought us a souvenir. Yeah. What's this? Uh, these are the typical German lederhosen since the Oktoberfest just started in, in Munich, and since you've been asking me to bring them along, <laughs> I actually thought I'd show you what they really look like. And these were yours uh, when these you were, were a kid? These were, in fact, mine, yes, and my twin sister used to wear a matching dirndl with lots of hearts and things on them. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> so listen, you have a theory about the Oktoberfest and how well you could make a little money. Tell me about that. Well, apparently they drink about 120,000 litres of beer every day at the Oktoberfest, a total of, what, 8 million or so litres over the time. Maybe that would help the the Greek people if we introduce something similar over there and <laughs> boost the economy. Rod, I'll bring you in. What do you reckon? Well, uh, it might work if it's only beer, but if you switch to Buzo, uh, <laughs> you'd be thinning out the Greek ranks of population pretty fast, I'd have thought. Rod, let me ask you, how are you feeling looking at the European situation today? I'm very mindful of the German politics in this, and um, Angela Merkel has been quite masterful, or, or mistressful, I suppose, uh, at ma managing this. However, over the last few weeks, there's been three significant developments. The first one is the German Constitutional Court gave almost full approval, a few little fish, fish hooks, to the European stability mechanism. Secondly, the European Commission announced the blueprint for pan-European banking supervision. And the third one was the European Central Bank um, uh, started um, unlimited purchases of bonds of member countries. So theoretically, those, not theoretically, those are the three cornerstones um, of, of stability. Lots of more detail to work out. The politics will get very messy. It's going to get more intense from a domestic position in Germany. Um, but maybe when the history is written, um, mid-September will be seen as a something of a turning point. For, and, and this is reflected in quite substantially lower interest rates for Spain, for example, at the moment. Yeah, uh, Spain's lining up for money. They're going to get it? Uh, from a German perspective, no. Angela Merkel is very strict on it. 
Schäuble, our finance minister, pretty much said, no, they're strong enough. Now they need to uh, deal with this situation themselves. And I'm not sure, I'm, I hear what, what you, you're saying, but um, there's uh, certainly the, a trend in the right direction, but I think it's too, too little, possibly too late, especially to help uh, Greece. I'm not sure they're doing enough. And uh, especially in Germany, the, the feeling is that something clear cut big needs to happen for uh, Europe to move on rather than to drag this thing out. But yes, uh, the, this new stability pact, the German people are not so happy about it because they fear that they are again the ones paying yeah. the bill of it. Um, I can see Greece being sacrificed um, and there's been a lot of work by the Greeks and elsewhere about what would happen if they exited. Um, if, and this is an incredibly big if, if it was possible for Greece to exit uh, without a much of a significant domino effect, um, then maybe um, Spain and Italy would squeak through. So um, Greek the Greek economy could well be sacrificed in this, at least in terms of membership. Now, there's been low growth and, and really stuttering activity right around in, in, right around the world in large parts of it. Uh, how are we doing here at home, Ian? Well, you have to look at it. And my, uh, the impression we're getting is the New Zealand economy is remarkably robust, although as we talk to clients, it's fluky. So some are seeing good growth, some are seeing no growth, and others are running very hard just to stand still. And I think we're not going to see a change in that. So. We're, we're talking to people now about this new normal. This is not, you know, we're, we're in where we are now. We're not going to go back to what it was like in 2007. And that's, so you've got to actually redesign your business model and actually prepare yourself to really work hard to make every sale. And, you know, growth's not going to come easy anymore. Yeah, and, and manufacturing in particular and, and the hard commodities, they're really taking a hammering. Uh, where's that going to take us, Rod? Um, there are two very telling charts in the most recent monetary policy statement from the Reserve Bank. The first one on growth overall um, had a separate chart on the contribution of the Christchurch rebuild to the economy. And in 2014-15, it's going to be 1.6% of GDP. But then if you look at the overall growth, it's starting to fall back at that point um, to ten, trending back towards 2%. In other words, net of Christchurch, there's only about a half a percent or so of growth in the rest of the economy. The other very interesting chart was of um, uh, manufactured sa manufacturer sales volumes. Um, and for domestic manufacturers, it's a really eye-watering collapse um, from over $7 billion a quarter to uh, uh, just about five now. Um, and no sign of that coming back. So there's a lot of domestic manufacturers yeah. are struggling, and then the export ones are obviously also struggling too because of the high dollar. And let me throw you just some names. A Nuplex, Kiwi Rail, Solid Energy, Rio Tinto, Norsk, Skog. Uh, hundreds of jobs uh, out, of the, uh, out of these companies in the past few months in New Zealand. Are we going to see more of this, Christoph? Uh, I fear we might. Uh, as Rod correctly said, a lot of the growth expectation is driven by the rebuild of Christchurch. And that's not really the right message we want to, to hear for the economy. Um, so I fear there's going to be some harder times in uh, predicted businesses really need to, to fight hard to get these sales and to stay in business. And you know, it's not just what's happening in Europe, gentlemen. It's also what's happening in the U.S. At the end of the year, there's going to be some real wake-up calls for the American people. Rod. Uh, the fiscal cliff, the uh, fiscal whereby cliff. temporary tax um, cuts are, are reversed and mandatory spending cuts come on. Uh, Technically, that would be uh, take 5% um, out of economic activity, which is a bit of a shock. And it'll be a lame duck Congress. So it'll be post-election with the old guys still in um, before the new ones are sworn in in January. Um, and it's really hard to imagine a lame duck Congress after a very bitter election campaign um, being able to deal with those issues. But maybe the ferocity of that a fiscal cliff might focus their minds. So I, I wouldn't want to write them off entirely, um, but that's the big thing to watch for um, in through November and December. Can I ask uh, you guys what you think is going to happen to the high New Zealand dollar? Are you going to get higher or going to come back? What are you picking? I think higher is my pick. How I, high? Well, I don't, I don't, and I, we're getting quite frustrated by some of the conversation that's going on at the moment about how New Zealand can do something to bring the dollar down because. I, I think the, the factors that are driving New Zealand dollar at the moment are nothing to do with the New Zealand economy. It's got no, no applicability to its fundamentals. So I, I think the, the issues that are driving it are particularly what's happening in the US. And for, as we see it, 
90 could be a, a position that it could reach. One, one of the concerns that I've got is just looking at what's happened in the last few weeks. The Australian dollar seems to be starting to reflect some of the challenges the Australian economy is having, which it hasn't done to now. And our exporters have therefore sort of had the benefit of having a reasonably positive um, trans-Tasman FX rate. I'm not sure we're going to get that benefit moving forward as well, which actually creates another further challenge to, to many of our export businesses. Christoph, I heard you mumbling in the background. Uh, what's your take <laughs> on it? Uh, absolutely right, Ian, that uh, the strong New Zealand dollar is not driven by New Zealand activity, but what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, and that's what we need to watch carefully. And that might ex even bring the government's role in, into play here. Do they need to do something or... Or not. Well, we have a new Reserve Bank governor. Uh, is it likely that he's going to intervene in the currency or at least in the interest rates? Uh, no, there's only been very minor changes to the policy target agreement between the government and, the new, and Graham Wheeler, the incoming um, Reserve Bank governor. So there would be no change there. However, there is a fantastically interesting debate uh, and very big intellectual change happening around the world about the nature of monetary policy. Um, and uh, I would have a different view from uh, the other two guests. Good, I'm um, glad. In what that, is it? Um, obviously, one of the factors that drives the New Zealand economy is relatively high interest rates. Um, and it would be possible to have lower interest rates in New Zealand, um, but then also have a whole range of different uh, monetary policy tools um, to uh, prevent that causing, for example, um, an, um, another housing asset bubble here. And um, I think it's a great shame that that debate is being stifled in New Zealand because we've got really serious and impressive economists like Olivier Blanchard, the chief economist of the IMF, um, editing books um, talking about this new um, uh, policy uh, world. And um, we are really behind on that. We used to be a leader in monetary policy 25 years ago, and we aren't now. Um, and uh, it would be great to see the debate take off in New Zealand. Hold that thought more after the break. Thanks, gentlemen. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world as our experts point out what's coming up. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks with Ian Proudfoot, Rod Oram, and Christoph Schumacher. And now it's time for Future Proof. But Ian, before we get to what's coming up for you, what about interest rates? As Rod says, uh, you know, could the new Reserve Bank governor uh, be looking at those? Would that make a difference? Um, I'm not convinced it would make a difference. I, I, I think... I'm a bit of an old-fashioned view that if we do cut interest rates, it will bring inflation into the economy quite quickly. And um, I'm, I, I don't see that as a positive at the moment. I think we, we, inflation by its nature isn't going to help employers because I think we're under a lot of wage pressure already. And um, if, if we can try and have a solution that, that does drop our exchange rate, I, I believe it will be temporary anyway. I think we'll move through that pretty quickly and we'll, we'll see another round of movement completely out of our control coming along again. I'll tell you one thing we could do is probably source some more offshore capital. Uh, we see higher, for example, uh, Chinese moving into uh, F&P, Fisher & Paykola. Where is that at, Rod, and what are your thoughts? Uh, well, the next big thing will be the um, valuation um, that the company has done on the, um, on the, comp uh, on the stock. Um, It'll obviously come in, I, I'm hoping it's going to come in higher than um, Hire's um, bid. Um, so that's, I think, due out in about 10 days or so. So that'll be quite fascinating. Uh, that will only, I think, fuel the debate, actually, um, because it won't fully reflect. It'll be a quite, quite a short-term view, because that's kind of all you can model. Um, um, and I would hope that we'd have a quite interesting discussion about the strategic value of uh, F&P. Speaking personally, I'm all for good foreign investment, um, but I have very clear views on what's good and what's bad. Um, and so, for example, in the agricultural sector, Shanghai Pengshin is bad foreign investment because all the way through the supply chain, whether it's on farm, in processing or out in the market, it contributes little, if anything, to the New Zealand economy. Hire's purchase of um, F&P could work if, if as long as Hire doesn't kill the culture it's trying to buy. Um, in Fisher and Paykel. That's a phenomenally difficult thing to do in a takeover. And um, this is Hire's first um, overseas takeover. Um, and therefore, I, I would not be optimistic that they were able to um, 
keep that distinctive culture in Fisher and Paykel um, and therefore keep significant activity to the benefit of the New Zealand economy here and keep that good innovation and marketing and all sorts of other culture coming through for hire. So uh, that's, that's where I'm a bit stuck on that one. Rod, you're not in favor of uh, selling the Crafer farms off to the Chinese, but Ian, you feel very differently, and yet that deal still hasn't gone through, still before the courts. No, from, I agree entirely with Rod that if we're going to have foreign investment, it's got to be beneficial to both the investor and the New Zealand economy. The Crafer deal, uh, I've said consistently, has had far too much profile. It's, it's only a relatively small transaction for a relatively small group of farms, and I think the fact that this has gone on now for over two years has been negative to our international um, relationships and it, you know the, the ability to source good quality foreign investment. And you know we, we as I've said to you before, we've definitely lost um, businesses that we've seen as being very good investors that have packed up and gone overseas and gone to look to invest in Australia rather than here because it's too difficult here at the moment. We need to be uh, we need an environment which welcomes people that really want to work with us to add value to our economy and bring their capital to do that. But you know, when you look at it, there's a whole heap of capital sitting in the agricultural sector at the moment that's really not being utilised. You know, I saw some figures the other day that 80% of the 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 or uh, the sheep and beef sector effectively has about 80% equity sitting on its balance sheet. It's just not leveraging that. It's not working that money hard. So we, we can actually do a lot better by using what we've got here as well. And we're just not doing that. What are you going to be watching, Christoph, over the next seven days? I'll certainly be watching what's happening in Europe because I believe the impact on the world economy will be huge. Um, it, it's a big thing that's happening. So uh, also from a social perspective, uh, Europe should unite and at the moment we see a big divide, so let's see what there. The United States is of course interesting uh, to watch and then we'll be keeping an eye on our incoming Reserve Bank Governor to see what he will do. Angela Merkel's up for re-election next year. Uh, what did you pick up on the ground when you were home in Germany? What are people um, saying? They're not. They're happy with her as long as she keeps strong and doesn't give too much money away to the EU. She's doing very well internationally. She just had a successful trip to China, so she is popular at the moment. But this is very fragile. As soon as Germany starts paying more to to rescue other nations, uh, she could be quickly gone. The question for me, Rod, is how long will the German people be prepared to be indentured to? you know, these massive debts. Uh, at some point, they've got to say, it's, it's, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore, um, aren't they? Well, the pain has to be shared across Europe, which is why the stability mechanism and the latest moves by the central bank um, are, are very important, because it starts to share that. Um, but I also think the Germans need to be reminded they've done incredibly well out of the Eurozone. Now, they've worked very hard at it, because they've been the only country that's managed to work with um, uh, no direct control over interest rates or exchange exchange rates um, and obviously a huge rebuild of the economy post reunification. So fantastic job. Um, but the German Germany is doing incredibly well out of a low euro right now. Um, and I think that it'd be important to uh, remind Germans of that from time to time. And Ian, what are you going to be watching over the next obviously, seven days? Obviously Fonterra's results. It'll be interesting to see those results and the reaction to the results. Um, I think the horticulture New Zealand and its levy vote um, is, is definitely going to be something that's going to create a lot of debate and discussion over the coming weeks. That's right, and, and the voting closes on Friday, so we will know whether or not they will support uh, their own industry association. Yeah, and you know, I, I think that's going to be quite defining in terms of the future of that sector. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks to my guests, Ian Proudfoot, Rod Oram, and Christoph Schumacher. And for you at home, our loyal viewers, a heads up. This is it. You've just watched the final edition of Money Talks. It's been fantastic. I'm proud of our team. We've really accomplished something great in this country with our uniquely rural program. And I'm grateful to you too at home for your loyal support. I'll treasure the friendships I've made, the education I've gotten, and the fun I've had. It's been a heck of a ride. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. So here's our final farewell to you from all of us, especially the unsung heroes here in TV land you rarely get to see. Looking at you makes me smile So enjoy yourself all the while Standing at the dock awaiting your Pequot To sail about the turbulent sea 